All right. Good morning once again, everybody, and welcome to day two of the PBS Customer Forum. Uh, my name is Eric Fulton. I'm the National Program Manager for Customer Outreach and Communication. I'm in PBS's Office of Portfolio Management and Customer Engagement. And most importantly, I'm very excited to be here for today's host, of our forum events. Uh, as you may have just heard, I do want to acknowledge that this Zoom session is being recorded, so please be aware of that. Uh, we do intend to post uh, links to this uh, video as well as the other days of the forum to our public facing website after the events conclude. Um, I do hope you were able to join us yesterday. We had three wonderful sessions, mostly focused on the uh, future of federal workplace with uh, our commissioner, with uh, some uh, senior leaders within GSA, and also with several federal agency customers going through space planning exercises. If you were unable to join us again, we did record that session. We will post it to uh, the, the GSA website and make you aware when that goes live. Today, however, we have two great sessions lined up. In just a few minutes, I'm gonna turn the forum over to one of our PBS workplace strategists who is going to discuss emerging and custom services and solutions for your space planning efforts. And following that, we have a wonderful panel on tap uh, to discuss all things electric vehicles, a very, very popular topic I know here at GSA, both on the PBS side and our FAS side. And we have representatives from both business lines with us today. We're gonna talk a little bit about procuring. We're gonna talk about charging stations and infrastructure. And we will also have utility considerations with some industry experts as well. Uh, before we formally start, I do wanna go over just a couple of fun housekeeping notes. Uh, we have automatically muted everyone's audio and that is to preserve the quality of our presentation for our speakers today. Um, as you are aware, we are using the FedRAMP compliant Zoom for government platform. Uh, we have found it to be very intuitive and user friendly. I do want to point out you can manipulate the view options on your screen. Um, on mine, it appears on the top right, there's a view button and you can choose a couple of different views that you can uh, maximize or minimize. You can also open or close the various chat and other Q&A pods as well and basically customize the screen to what works best for you. I want to take a moment to talk about those pods. There are two that we'll be using today. There's the chat pod and the Q&A pod. They have distinct uses. So please use the chat pod. If you have questions of a technical matter, if you're having some sort of troubleshooting issues, um, or you have questions for the forums team not related to the subject matter. If you have questions for our subject matter experts and our presenters, we want to hear them, but we need them in the Q&A pod, please, because that's where we queue them up. And uh, we will either answer them behind the scenes uh, in text or we will pull them out and ask them to our presenters at a point during the presentation today. So once again, subject matter questions, please use that Q&A pod. Thank you very much. And finally, we have enabled live captioning on Zoom. It's a two-part process. Uh, so we have enabled the auto transcription, but if you would like to take advantage of that, you have to do so as well. There underneath, there's either an option at the bottom of your screen uh, that says enable live transcription, or you can click on the three dot more button and you can find uh, the subtitle option in there. So you can take advantage of that. So with housekeeping behind us, I do want to begin today's program and introduce uh, our first speaker, and he is Ryan Dorfler. And Ryan is a senior workplace strategist with GSA's Total Workplace Program Management Office. As a workplace strategist, Ryan assists federal agencies in identifying workforce arrangements that support employee work practices and achieve agency business goals. So in addition to all the customer workplace engagements that he handles, Ryan also develops tools and publications, resources that GSA employees and other federal agencies can use to fur uh, further federal workplace programs. Uh, his most recent tool is the Workforce, I'm sorry, the Workplace Investment and Feasibility Modeling Tool, also known as WIFM. And if you joined us yesterday, you heard, uh, I believe, our commissioner speak a little bit about that. And so he is going to be discussing the WIFM model uh, tool, uh, giving a little demonstration as along with uh, several other things in his presentation today. Uh, so Ryan, welcome and the floor is yours. 
Great, thank you very much, Eric. Um, and thank you everybody for having me. Um, today I'm gonna be talking about um, both custom and emerging workplace services and solutions that we're providing our clients. And I've broken it up into two parts, if you will. Um, the first, what we're gonna do is talk about how we provide workplace strategy services that are customized to our client agencies, whether they be in our national office or regional office or field locations. Um, when we look at, or we provide these services, what we always do is we, we look beyond just the office space and planning of it or in the furniture. What we'd like to do is what we want to do rather is look at the, all those different facets that go into what we might call an effective workplace. I mean, certainly things related to the space itself and where that where that location of the workplace may be are certain um, important considerations, as well as furniture and equipment, and certainly these days technology. Um, if you think back before the pandemic, um, and then basically through the pandemic, we really had to rely on technology to allow our organizations and then to connect with our peers and still continue to work effectively for the American taxpayer. Um, what we also do when we provide these services, we also look at things related to business processes, basically how the organization works now and how they would like to work in the future. And, and, and we also look at it how, um, as far as the employees, the staff, those that are accomplishing your agency's mission as far as how are they communicating with each other, what's the culture of your organization like and what, what it can be in the future. And, and what we do is in the services we provide and the recommendations that we co-create with our clients, we look at all of these different facets that contribute to an effective workplace. What we found is when we when we neglect one, two, or even three of these, that workplace or that office that you're in or that office that may be your home office, what we find is that it doesn't work nearly as effective as it could be if we looked at everything here you see on your screen. Certainly an important consideration is where an individual accomplishes their work. Uh, to, before the pandemic, it used to be a bit of more of a binary equation, if you will. It's like you work in the office all the time and maybe you work from home one day a week or one day per pay period. And then some individuals like myself work, um, work uh, remotely full time. Um, now we have an increasing degree of, of complexity here where individuals can work anywhere on that, if we call it a hybrid continuum, if you will. And when we do our workplace strategy um, services, provide those to our clients, one of the things that we do is engage our clients to understand their, as far as the positions that are accomplishing the work, which of the, where could they lie both um, as the position as well as individuals lie on this continuum and where could they be as far as um, working more most effectively for the organization. Um, and what we wanna do is we, these recommendations is also use it as a lever, if you will, to really transform that workplace and that organization um, well into the future. Now, with the looking at the hybrid continuum and, and looking at those facets of that go into an effective workplace, what it does is it creates an opportunity for those clients to engage us to really reshape the federal workplace. Um, traditionally, it's been what you see there on the top is um, workstations and offices and different types of support spaces. As organizations and their staff become increasingly doing um, working remotely, um, doing much more frequent telework, that will actually change or could change the federal office space to be much more of a collaborative center, if you will. What it also does is it allows us to look at alternative work settings. Some of those services that we've just um, started providing through our flexible co-working services um, just a few months ago, um, and then, um, or actually earlier this fiscal year rather, uh, as well as other new services I'll be talking about in a bit. Um, the other thing that we recognize in GSA is that with all of these looking at the workplace and looking at how individuals can do their work and recognizing that the federal landscape as far as the federal workplace will be changing or could change dramatically in the future, it also creates an opportunity for us to make it more modernized. Um, you see some of those aspects there, flexibility, um, creating a healthy workplace, sustainability certainly, and a safe uh, workplace as well as office. But it also allows us to make a much more efficient as well, optimized, if you will, 
uh, related to mission delivery, asset utilization, um, looking at how the workplace locations, headquarters and regional offices and field offices um, connect with each other virtually, as well as um, operationally speaking, and of course, cost efficiency as well. Um, so the strategies that we provide um, and when, when a client engages us in what we call workplace engagement, what we would do is we would customize those services and how we do that to ensure that we really look at all those different aspects of the workplace. One method that we use is something called activity-based planning, and this is a bit of a shameless plug for, for this publication that you can find, um, download on the link down below. Or you can email me at workplace at gsa.gov and I'd be happy to send you a copy, which really details the approaches that we use for looking at the workplace, understanding how the organization works and collecting information, research um, data to inform those recommendations. In the services we provide, what we do is we always make sure in those workplace strategy services that they connect to these four different um, elements, if you will. Um, the first one ensuring that the, the, our recommendations and how the data that we collect from employees and leaders connects to the business goals. We wanna understand how your agency, the, the office that's going through the workplace change within your agency, what are the mission related goals that they're, they're seeking to achieve, both now and potentially in the future. We wanna make sure that the workplace that's provided and the recommendations and the strategies that we offer you all lead to the achievement of those goals. And so of course, a big part of that is, is us understanding what those goals are. Um, one approach that we use is we, we take a look at your goals and we divide them up into four categories. What we found is that this modified version of the balanced scorecard is a good framework for doing that um, and looking at different aspects as far as whether they may be financial goals or customer goals at the bottom. Um, what we found is that by, by understanding these goals and understanding what um, as far as how you're accomplishing your mission, there are certain workplace strategies that really allow you to do that successfully. And certainly some workplace strategies, not so much. Um, to give any example, um, like business process goals, maybe your organization really wants to increase the transfer of knowledge um, between individuals or between organizations. Um, this is particularly important for those organizations where they might have a distributed workforce in which it basically means um, employees working at different locations, but on a common task or a common goal. Well, certainly a, a workplace strategy to support that is along the lines of virtual collaboration, really looking at that. One thing to remember amongst all of these services and after this session is over is our workplace strategists, we don't focus just on space. What we do is we look at the people, place, and technology that all come together to really create those vibrant um, workplaces for your organization. Um, another example of how we connect to, to our goals is um, to our agency's um, um, goals that they want to achieve or like people goals, for instance. Maybe your organization is finding that it's like, we we'll really need to focus on attracting new talent and retaining the talent that we have. Um, one thing that we're finding um, in GSA as well is um, as far as the flexibility and the schedule and being able to work from home and having the tools to be able to do that can be a way of attracting um, new federal employees um, um, to our agency. And so what we do is we understand these goals and again, connect those to workplace strategies. So when those are implemented, your goals are achieved. Um, the other thing that we do in, in our services is always make sure they're connected to what we call work patterns. Um, what that essentially is, is looking at a structured way of looking at how regardless of the employees in your organization and the positions and the type of work they do, um, what we do is we look at how they accomplish their work. And we have a categorization system, if you will, that um, allows us to create different types of workplace strategy, particularly around space planning and technology recommendations for each of those uh, work patterns. The way that it works is we use work patterns to help uh, to help our agencies and to help us as well say which of these we got lots of different space types here and and and, and increasingly different locations as well. Um, space and where individuals do their work doesn't necessarily have to be at the office anymore. 
They can, they can be looking at the far right, they can be working from home or working at a co-working um, um, location, whether it's offered by the private sector or um, offered by ourselves through our Flex Hub offering, which will be coming, um, um, start to be coming um, available in the end of the summer. What work patterns do in our approach is say, we have this lots of different spaces to choose from. Which ones are right for our um, client agency's um, staff? Um, and how many it, um, as far as for a particular location. What we also do is we look at the varying degrees of mobility, that hybrid continuum, and understand um, different uh, for his empl uh, different employees, where, where their preferences are with as far as being able to work, of course, within the context of uh, what the agency's policies are as far as allowing their employees to work um, where, uh, wherever they may be on this continuum. And what we do is we take this information and we use this categorization system and we essentially look at all positions in, in two ways. One, where can the work be accomplished in the future? Ideally, so they become those, those employees um, accomplish the work more effectively. Uh, we divide that into three categories, ranging from an individual mostly at their desk in the office to someone that's hardly in the office and working from home, maybe working from home full time. What we also do is look at when they're in the office, the nature of the work that's being accomplished at their desk. Um, the reason why we look at this, because this gets to certain acoustic and lighting considerations and each of these boxes here or buckets, we basically classify into six different work patterns. Um, each of these leads to a very different type of space recommendation. Um, a technology recommendation, uh, maybe some business process recommendations, as well as how these um, different um, individuals may work together, particularly if you have a wide variety of work patterns um, of, of going on within a single organization. And we use this to select the ideal mix of workplace elements for a given work pattern. This is a starting point for that customized approach as far as developing those strategies for our clients. The other thing that we do is we always make sure that we collect information from our leadership, the client agency leaders that we're working with, as well as the employees that are occupying or are part of that organization undergoing the workplace change. What we found over and over again, and we've been doing this workplace strategies since about 2005 or so, is when we don't collect or understand the latter part from the employee perspective, or we don't fully appreciate the leader's perspective either, um, we, and the important information is missing. And it's hard for us to really create solid workplace strategy recommendations when that part is missing. So by collecting this information through a variety of research tools, what it does is allows us to get really keen understanding of the organization, what makes it tick, and those, those variables that need to be taken into account in the record services that we provide. And the, the, the tools that we use to collect this information range from focus groups um, of leadership called a visioning session, to focus groups to employees, surveys certainly is something that we use. And then we also look at, um, we typically hire a workplace consultant to provide an independent perspective to assess how the space is being used or the resources are being used, whether the, uh, the resource may be the space or maybe the technology, um, as well as um, accessing the building and those kinds of things. We collect all this information. We use a variety of different techniques to do that. You see these here. One of these techniques, the one in the middle on the top, the pre-occupancy survey, is actually, mo actually most of these um, uh, research tools we would hire a consultant to do. Um, but the one on the very top in the middle, the pre-occupancy sur survey, is, is, is a service we provide our clients um, at no cost. And the reason why we do that is because, one, it allows you to get um, some really great data um, as far as uh, how your employees are feeling about their current work, what they would like to work, how they would like to work in the future. Think of it as like a mobility assessment, if you will. Um, what it, and the other reason why we like to do it is it allows us to look at broader federal agency trends. Um, and so if you're interested in using a workplace survey or workplace survey services, again, you can reach out to me at workplace at gsa.gov and I'd be happy to send you the details about that. Um, what we do is when we collect this information 
and we're collecting it from the organization that's going through the workplace change. Um, so if it's a field office in Seattle, Washington, where I live, <clears throat> excuse me, what we would do is we would um, do the surveys and the interviews and the visioning session of the leadership there in Seattle. Using this information, then what we do is we look at that. It's like, okay, what are the workplace strategies that would allow that organization to achieve their goals, to allow those positions to the individuals accomplishing the work to be successful, um, as well as create a vibrant and healthy and sustainable workplace as well. <clears throat> the way that we do that is we look at multiple strategies. We don't rely on one solution because um, a colleague of mine, Kevin Kelly, <clears throat> excuse me, a, Kevin, a colleague of mine, Kevin Kelly, likes to say one size misfits all. And so what we do is we look at a variety of workplace strategies based off of this information. And then um, we offer those to the client for consideration and ideally we co-create them um, with them. Um, these strategies may certainly touch upon each of those different facets of the effective workplace. Um, they may be basic space recommendations, such as design principles, uh, creating a kit of parts, if you will, of different types of spaces. Um, that kit of parts approach is really useful if, um, if you're from a national organization like the headquarters and you're creating space policies for multiple locations in the field, we can create design guidelines for you um, using information from pilot projects, employee surveys, um, those things that those, and those different re research techniques that I just mentioned earlier. <clears throat> Certainly what we also do is we can provide space program calculations and space programs are essentially those line by line calculations of how much space you need uh, that you can provide to us uh, so we can deliver that space. Um, what we, is, if you're from a headquarters organization, those space program calculations typically take the form of templates um, that, are, that are meant to uh, connect to the space policies that you may have. Um, if we've developed a kit of parts, um, design guidelines also, the space program template would be provided along with that. Um, and it's developed in such a way, so if you happen to have field offices across the country, that space program calculation tool would be customized for field offices and would contain many of the co most common types of um, office type, administrative office spaces, as well as special type spaces or mission critical spaces that your agency may have. Desk sharing strategies is certainly a consideration as well. And taking into account uh, those design guidelines as lighting and acoustics. Um, the other strategies we'll look at are related to real estate. Um, this is increasingly becoming important as the, for those organizations that are considering co-working um, locations for their more distributed personnel, those, those individuals that are frequent teleworkers or remote workers that may come into the office um, every now and then. Um, part of the uh, calculation is like, it's certainly if you have employees working from home or working out, um, outside the office and you're using um, some co-working space for them to drop in periodically in, in certain lo locations, that's, that's part of the calculation. We look at that, so it's like, what's the uh, footprint for the office space? How much space is being, could be potentially be saved by those ind individuals working from home? but also looking at what's the total amount of space when you add in the co-working um, uh, locations as well and the cost associated with them. Looking at mobile work, it changes how we look at also the portfolio, the real estate portfolio of that organization. And that's included in the analysis that we provide our clients. Furniture, configuration of the furniture, ergonomics, um, different other types of equipment features is, is also included. Um, I'm sure many of you think like, yes, we know as far as like the office location. But what we also do, and one of the new services I'm going to get to in a minute, is also look at how can we provide uh, furniture and technology quickly for those home office workers as well through our home office solutions um, offering. Um, technology we look at, and we also look at um, business processes uh, particularly around for those um, agencies um, that's going through the workplace change, if they're very distributed, again, meaning those employees are working in different locations um, for one organization um, on a common task or project, what we want to do is we want to understand how those processes are performing now, 
and how they could um, be improved in the future. Um, culture is something that we always want to take a look at. And I got an example of that in a second um, is look at as far as the um, how is the culture working now? What is the ideal culture for that organization and how close are they um, as, as, as all the employees in, in achieving that and, and experiencing that culture? Um, to give you an example of how we uh, again customize these services for our clients, we have two organizations here and, and on the left and this one here, um, you see a pie chart there. And this organization um, is, has about 38% of the population uh, work. This is working in the office, not working from home. 38% um, of, the, of, of the employees in this organization want to work from home full time. While on the, on the light blueish, it says like 12% um, or so want to work in the office um, all the time. So the two ends of the hybrid continuum and the different colors of, of the wedges there correspond to different levels of telework. What you see on the right in the quadrants there is a way of, of looking at culture. Um, the blue shaded um, part is um, what, where the organization currently feels their culture is. Um, and then the outline is where, they, where the employees feel their culture should be. In this particular instance, this organization enjoys having, they, they currently have a culture where it's a strong sense of community um, together as a team working together on common tasks and they really wanna keep it like that. They don't wanna change and they're about to experience a workplace change. I wanna make sure that's not lost. Another organization, part of the same agency, part of the same location. These are two business um, lines uh, from an actual client. Um, the other organization, it, it's very different than the first organization. This instance, 76% of the employees wanna work from home. And um, basically they don't wanna be in the office at all. And another 17.6% only wanna go into the office two days per pay period or one day per week. Very distributed organization. And what you'll see is that they're, uh, where they're seeing their culture now and where they, where they want it to be in the future, very different. Right now, it has that same sense of community as the first organization. While what they recognize is their mission is very different from the first one, is that because of their mission, they need to become more innovative, more creative, um, really look at things um, as far as differently as how to accomplish their mission. Um, very much along the same lines as far as the services we like to provide. We look at um, as far as uh, my business line, look, it's like, how can we be more innovative and look at that? So. What we do is these are two different teams in the same agency, same organization, overall organization, same location. And what we do is say we recognize that these two organizations have two different degrees of preferred telework levels and two very different um, um, future culture um, states, if you will, that they would like to see achieved in this workplace change that's about to happen to them. And what we do is we look at, again, those six facets of an effective workplace is workspace, real estate, furniture and equipment. What are the solutions or approaches that allow both of these organizations to get what they want, to achieve those goals in a way that allow each of them to be successful, not just one and not just the other. Now, what I wanna do is talk about shift gears a little bit. So that should give you a little bit of a taste of the workplace strategy services that we provide, how we do it and how we customize it for our client agencies. Um, what I do wanna do is shift gears a little bit and talk about more of the emerging services and solutions we, we're providing and developing right now. Um, look, going back to our hybrid continuum um, from office space space uh, employees that are in the office a lot to remote work employees that don't need to go into the office very often. Um, we have something called Workplace 2030 that I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard about um, over the last year or two. Essentially what this is is, is looking at learning from um, our experiences during the pandemic and recognizing that the nature of work and the nature of workplaces um, has changed significantly. And so we're, we're um, developing new services and offerings to um, support that shift and to um, look at different ways of work. <clears throat> what you see there are some of those new offerings that are currently in develop right now. We've actually bundled these into three basic services. 
Um, the first one is based off of what we've on, what we learned from our client agencies that we've engaged with over the last two years is that agencies are increasingly willing to share space. Um, certainly long as long as as long as the security aspects and the special support spaces and those kinds of things allowed are are provided. Uh, but generally speaking, our clients, many of our clients are willing to share space. And so along those lines, what we've done is we've developed one service that's available right now, and we're developing another one right now, which will be available later on this summer, um, all along the lines of space as a service. Um, the first one is something called flexible co-working services. Um, this is the private sector space as a service. Um, and what this is, essentially, we have contracts, um, an IDIQ contract with five firms, I believe, that allow us to provide um, um, co-working services locations uh, for client agencies. Um, this is meant to address short-term surges or if you have an employee that's traveling into um, um, a different location, let's say to a project site, or maybe they need to go to a university to do um, some work. Uh, this allows them to have um, a short-term office space and one of the nice benefits of this to jump down to the last bullet is it does these um, locations do provide the full complement of equipment and furniture necessary for that individual, that employee of yours to um, perform their work um, successfully. Um, it is intended for short-term use. Um, that's why it has a, a, a term less than 12 months and we actually priced it based off of the number of individuals. Um, that will be using the co-working space. Um, the method that we do that is through a service agreement. It's not a lease. Um, and it, because this is a private sector co-working space, you do not have exclusive access to it. The space is offered as is, and you're basically you're you dropping down in a spot. And at the end of the day, um, the employees that are using that location do need to clear um, everything um, off their desk. Different types of spaces are available, ranging from different workstation sizes and office sizes. Um, and to jump just straight ahead to the bottom here, if you would like more information about that, if you're interested in flexible co-working services, I encourage you to reach out to Patrick Convoy or Jane Schuster, and you see those email addresses there, um, and they would be happy to get you more details about that. Um, one thing to think about is that the co-working services is only available in the continental US, um, no Hawaii, no Alaska, um, no Puerto Rico or territories. Um, and it is, we, it is funded through an RWA, again, as um, we do a service contract to that, do that. Um, the other space as a service that we're providing or will be providing at the end of December is something called Flexa. All it is is the, the, the federal version of the private sector co-working space. Uh, what we're doing is it's also space as a service. Um, what it allows GSA to do is if we happen to have excess capacity at a, uh, in a city in one of our federal buildings, what we could do is we say, okay, if there's no demand for this, um, this space, office space at that federal building, is we can essentially repurpose it as a co-working space. Um, so other federal agencies can use that. Maybe they have staff that's coming in, um, arriving at a location, and they need some temporary space for um, a few weeks or so. And we'll be able to accommodate them in exactly the same way um, as the flexible co-working um, services that I, I talked about earlier. Um, what it also allows us to do is that it allows us to really tailor, because it's in our federal space, allows us to customize it a bit more than what we might otherwise would have to, um, uh, what we couldn't do in the private sector version. Um, one of those being federal building security screening. Um, another one is if there is enough agencies that have a similar type of mission and they're interested in, in sharing a space that happens to have um, mission critical type spaces or special spaces, we can look at doing a flex hub type of arrangement for that as well. Again, available later this summer. Um, we're going to be piloting that through um, another service offering called our Workplace Innovation Lab. And then at, once that's released, and you can try that out um, after um, starting in September or so. And then we're going to look at doing additional flex hubs across the country. Um, 
the last one, or the, sorry, the second one relates to um, again, that workplace innovation lab that I mentioned earlier. Hey, Ryan, can I yeah. uh, jump in for just a moment? Because we do sure. have a question that relates to uh, co-working that came in. And I, before sure. we get too far off the topic, wanted to, to ask you. Yeah. Um, and you did touch on this, but it might be worth reiterating just for uh -huh. customers out there. Uh, the customer is asking, um, what sort of setup time is required for an agency to access co-working space in other areas? Areas. So this is about, I think, the flexible co-working services contract as opposed to the Flex Hub. Um, but can you just review that one more time? Yeah. So once we will receive your RWA, the process is essentially we would do um, issue an order against the IDIQ um, contracts for these services. Um, there's five firms. Four of them are small businesses. Again, anywhere in the continental U.S. And it usually takes avail it takes about five weeks. Um, be, before the space is available. The space already exists. I mean, it's, it, it's not like the, the co-working vendors are creating it anew, if you will. The space already exists. The five weeks is really about finding the right location, verifying with you that the location works for you, and doing the paperwork and, and the contracting on our end um, to get that space available to you. So I would say roughly about five weeks. Um, if it's something more critical than that, more of a time constraint, um, again, I would I'd say reach out to both Jane and Patrick, whose email addresses are at the bottom, and they can kind of look into it um, as far as seeing what's available. Certainly, I think one of the considerations is where is it located? If there happens to be um, multiple co-working vendors in one geographic, like New York City, for instance, it might be a bit easier than if it happens to be one vendor in one location, for instance. But again, about five weeks or so. Um, so I'm going to just sort of jump ahead. Hopefully that answers that question. If not, um, again, the plug for our email address, you can also reach out at workplace at gsa.gov. It goes to myself, Jane, Patrick, and the entire workplace strategy office. Um, workplace Innovation Lab is another service offering. Um, that's going to be coming along, online available later this summer. Um, the Flex Hub Pilot and Workplace Innovation Lab is basically the, it's, it's the same thing. We're doing two offerings in one effort. Um, it's our 25,000 square foot um, proving ground for furniture and technology solutions, not just furniture. Um, through BAML agreements that we have with multiple vendors, um, it allows us to create a very vibrant um, an exciting to new workplace environment. Um, you can tour it, uh, just walk through it. If you're interested in seeing the offerings um, from the partners there in 2022 and 2023, you can tour the Workplace Innovation Lab. You'll notice that we have technology and furniture. One of the things we want to emphasize is we're also trying out new technology and not just like the screens that you might see in the meeting rooms and those kinds of things, but also the back end technology as it relates to reservation systems, um, managing the space and those kinds of things. And so if you want to tour it, you can. Um, if you want to experience it, you can as well through our Flex Hub service. Um, as soon as the ribbon cutting date is set, you can expect to hear a lot of announcements about that. Um, certainly tours and very likely a client enrichment series session as well. Um, and I believe also we're going to be trying to do virtual tours also at the same time. So that way, if you, if you happen to not be in Washington, D.C., you can also experience it um, as much as possible virtually at the same time. Um, the last one I want to address real quickly is of the three offerings that have come out of our Workplace 2030 effort is something called Home Office Solutions. Um, this one is also going to be available um, for clients at the end of the fiscal year um, or so. Um, this one relates, it used to be called Home Office in a Box, and we realized the box was basically limiting us on the possibilities, and we changed it to Home Office Solutions. Um, a, a bit of a little rebranding there. Uh, what it essentially does is if you have an employee that's working from home significantly, that remote worker, like myself, I'm a remote worker, and they need new technology or a new desk or a new um, chair, and your agency's policies allow for the provisioning of the furniture, for instance. Um, this is an easy, will be an easy way for your age or for your employee to identify the right type of chair that might that would best support them. Maybe they have back problems. Maybe they have um, different as far as like, um, they just have um, something, they know something feels more comfortable than other types of model. Essentially what this is, is an easy way to order 
furniture and technology, um, as well as storage. And you see some of the furnishings there, as well as, oops, let's go on to the next one. There we go. And the IT equipment associated with that through our GSA Advantage um, service through our through FAS. Um, what's nice about this is, is that it, it makes it really easy for, or will make it really easy for federal employees to select those and route that to the purchasing officials in your agency. And it will be managed um, basically just like any other personal property um, that your agency may have to um, purchase. Um, the, the ordering authority is that each agency is able to deliver or determine the usage level and the dollar allowance for the per person that's placing the order. Um, we're going to have a bunch of online guides and video tutorials available on the site um, when it's up and running, everything related to um, Hove Office um, solutions, how purchase card holders, the things they need to consider, all that kind of stuff. Um, essentially, the process is that that we're envisioning it is that federal employee would go into the um, GSA Advantage and the Home Office Solutions section and basically pick the products that they need for their home office um, within their limit, of course. Um, the agency approves it and then agrees to fund it. And then um, after going through this process, the employee um, parks their items in the cart and then the agency um, purchasing official is notified that it's there and is, 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 is able to make the purchases on that employee's behalf. Once the products are delivered, then they're delivered to the employee's home, not to the federal office and the employee has to go pick it up. And the employee is responsible for the receipt, the receipt of the, the products and the installation of that um, as far as like if it's for furniture, certainly. Um, but the product ownership is maintained by the purchasing agency. Um, and then there's other details related to personal property and if it happens to be disposed of excess and those kinds of things. Um, so this is an offering that's in development right now. It'll be coming out very soon um, in basically next month. Um, in July of, of, of this year, we're going to be piloting it with GSA employees. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of things related to tracking and ordering and processing um, behind the scenes of the web page um, and the processes that we need to make sure are um, worked out. Um, and GSA employees that are interested can pi uh, participate in the pilot. And then in, in, in the period from August to December, um, if we need to, we can, we'll do an external customer pilot. However, this would be the period when it would be rolled out, basically the end of the calendar year. Um, and then certainly we always love feedback from our customers about how it's working and how we can improve it well into the future. Um, just like the Workplace Innovation Lab and just like FlexHub, uh, when this is available um, for our clients to try out and participate, use, um, you can expect to hear a lot more from us um, at GSA, and I'm sure there'll be a client enrichment series session to talk about this as well. Um, and if you're interested um, about learning more about this, um, you can reach out to Jane Schuster at jane.schuster at gsa.gov. Um, so the last thing I want to bring up, one of our emerging services is something called the Workplace Investment and Feasibility Modeling Tool. Um, it's a mouthful, so we just call it WIFM. And so this is actually the second version of the tool. Um, the first version of the tool was, it was a bit complicated, and I'll share a screenshot of it in a second. But in, in both versions of WIFM, it's all about how can we um, encourage ourselves and how can we help um, our client agency leaders think about workplace change earlier, much earlier than we've traditionally been used to. Um, if you have space with us and an occupancy agreement, I'm sure you're familiar with um, um, gentle reminders about when we need your requirements so we can begin the space delivery process and then you maybe get to collect your space requirements and we start delivering the space. Um, what we find is with dramatic workplace changes, particularly ones where if an agency is significantly downsizing or really changing the makeup of their organization as far as their location, like let's say they used to be centralized and they're now they're going really distributed with a lot of remote employees. We need to start thinking about requirements, space requirements, overall workplace requirements a lot earlier than that, um, than what we've traditionally have. 
with them as a way of kind of, of, of uh, as a tool, it's an Excel based tool where you can use it and say, run scenarios saying, okay, if we're gonna shift from a very centralized office-based organization to one that's very decentralized and the workers are predominantly remote workers, what is the degree of workplace change associated with that? And what are some of the things that we need to think about? It allows you to run those scenarios really quickly and easily and see what direct overall direction you wanna take from the workplace perspective which allows us and you to begin planning requirements earlier. And so that way, when we look at that curve, um, it allows us to go back. So, so that way the curves are a little bit brighter, allows us on the green curve that we have a much greater chance ability to impact costs and functional capabilities of that space. As we all know, the later we make changes in the design and delivery process, the more costly it gets. And so the way of help of minimizing the risks associated with that. Um, another way to think about it, um, if you're familiar with our previous project lifecycle, um, if you've been on any of our occupancy solutions client enrichment series, so you're probably familiar with different degrees of requirements, uh, strategic requirements being that very high level, going to technical requirements under planning, which is a much more detailed requirements. Um, agency build out requirements, if you will. Um, we have workplace strategy services that align with all of that. And I, I very briefly summarized that in the beginning in that activity-based planning. We also provide post-occupancy evaluation services and change management services throughout the entire thing. With, um, think of it as a feasibility scenario tool. Think, think of it as a way of quickly looking at trying out different overall ideas as far as how your, your employees, where they might be doing their work, looking at the overall space impact, and you can use that to inform those strategic requirements, those high level outcomes um, that you wanna achieve. And you can start thinking about, okay, how do we further refine that into functional and technical requirements? Now, WIFM, the first version of WIFM, I think was released in like 2018 or so. And admittedly, I'm, I'm, the, I was, I'm the developer of WIFM in-house, which is, which is fine. Uh, but and so I can say this is that um, the user interface was terribly overcomplicated. The color scheme was a bit garish and bright. Um, the, the tool itself was very powerful in that when you provided some information about your current space, you can run different scenarios to see the impact of things like desk sharing and uh, different workstation and office sizes that are on the top in the blue, purple, and pink in each of those scenarios. And you can see the overall rough order magnitude impact associated with those, whether related to space, um, you see there in the workplace area there, or as well as overall cost. Um, rough order magnitude cost. Um, think of it as plus or minus 30%. Um, the reason why that's rough order magnitude is because this is very high level feasibility scenario type of, 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 of scenario of estimating, if you will. What we found though, is that this tool, while it, it's, it can be useful, the learning curve is a bit steep. Um, there were other aspects of the tool that got too much into the details and that ended up, um, ended up being a, a limiting factor on its user adoption. So what we did is we took a step back and said, let's go back to our uh, overall approach of looking at work patterns and how individuals do their work. And also let's take a look um, at the hybrid continuum and make sure we take that into account because that's certainly where individuals do their work will certainly impact how um, the amount of space that might be needed and the nature of that space. And what we did is we combined those together um, to create a new um, logic, if you will, that feeds the next version of WIFM. For each of the different levels of telework, there's supporting work patterns underneath of that. And for each work pattern is a mix of, of office, workstation offices and support spaces that feed into the calculations. Using this approach, it's really allowed us to, 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 to make things a lot easier from the user perspective. So that way, as based off of certain choices, you can idea for this, for instance, this individual might be in the office working mostly at their desk, what the next version of WIFM does is says, we know that generally speaking, this mix of spaces would be ideal for them. While let's say if they're frequently teleworking and maybe they're not in the office a whole like a lot, but when they are, they interact with others, this might be the mix of spaces that's right for them. 
So this tool calculates all of that. Um, one of the nice things about the tool is one, it's a lot easier to look at. Um, two, it's a lot, a whole lot easier to use. And the third one is it's a whole lot easier to customize for you. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna very, very quickly do a very quick demo of this tool for you. Um, and I'm gonna see if I can go over to that. And what I'm gonna do is, oops, I'm gonna get out of this real quick. And there's the tool. So the way that it works in the next five minutes or so is you just put in some basic information about which, uh, about your current space. We'll make it, there we go. And we'll make this really to act, to make exaggerate things, there we go. And for each of the scenarios, what you can do is you identify the distribution of personnel along each of these um, different levels of telework ranging from office on that hybrid continuum that I've been showing throughout this presentation. You can also, what you also do is select a degree of workplace change that you're interested in investigating. So let's say our current, oops, not that one. Um, let's say our current one, eh, it's not working. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. And so let's say right now, currently your, your organization is about 50% of the individuals are office-based, another 20% is there, and we'll say, and we'll change this up to 20 and change that to 10. So let's say that's what your current um, organization is like, and you really wanna see um, how far can you go as far as the degree of workplace change and as far as how distributed that organization is. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip these at the distrib distribution of the different positions, and what you'll see to go over here just a little bit, there we go, is that um, the, you can achieve a much higher degree of space savings by looking at um, the distribution of the personnel. Um, what you can also do is as you change the degrees of workplace change, everything also recalculates as well. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and close this and go back to my slides. Um, in late July, uh, we'll do it. We're going to be doing a client enrichment series that really gets into WIFM in a lot more detail, the background calculations and how we can customize this for your agency. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to go ahead and close it. Uh, no, I don't want to save it. And I'm going to go back to the presentation and I'm going to reshare that and we're going to move on. And the one last thing I want to leave you with when it comes to our services whether it's our customized workplace services as well as, or those emerging services that I highlighted really briefly, is that the intent is that they would all support these six facets, if you will, of the effective workplace. Um, so if you're interested in investigating these, I would say, again, reach out to us at GSA at workplace at gsa.gov. Um, and what we can do is we can, we'll develop a customized uh, workplace engagement proposal for you about how the way, whether we, whether it's nationally, you wanna do it across your agency or for spe spe specific location, we would love to hear from you. Um, so with that, I think that's it. Actually, I forgot one thing, sorry about that. Uh, we do have a network of regional workplace executives across the country. So if you're looking at a workplace engagement for a specific location, um, feel free to reach out to any of these workplace executives and I'd be happy to help as well. Um, or of course, you can reach out to us at workplace at gsa.gov. Now with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Eric to see if there's any questions for the remaining few minutes of our session. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. That was a great presentation. It's always great to see what, what you guys are, are coming up with and coming out of the, the center that, that your team does. Um, a couple of things. One, uh, there was a note in the chat. Can you just one more time, the WIFM tool, when will that be available? It will be available the end of next month. The end of um, next month. The end of the next month. Yeah, we're going to be doing a client enrichment series session just on with them. Um, it will be available definitely by the end of next month. It's just a matter of, of, of myself and Eric and your team just figuring out a date. Um, I believe we're looking at somewhere around July 19th or so. Um, but when that session happens, that's going to be the release of the tool itself. Also, I, I think that we were and we'll obviously uh, certainly share that that broadly with, with this audience when that information is available. Um, there, there's one open question in the chat. It's, it's specific to uh, a 
type of building, but I think we can we can extrapolate it out. The question the customer is asking is mm -hmm. about how these workplace strategies will apply in uh, particularly in courtrooms and chamber settings, uh, probably mm -hmm. a, a judiciary question. Um, but I'd like you, if you could kind of expand on that, a lot of the solutions or the WIFM tool or things that you've been talking about, do mm -hmm. those apply to more than just traditional office space settings or what, what can we offer in sort of non-traditional space settings? Yes, yeah. So when it comes to those agencies that have like a, a significant, or if you happen to have um, non-office space, whether it's called special space or mission space or whatever, however term, non-office space, um, we certainly do look at that. So if you're an agency that has labs, laboratory space, and you're interested in investigating how to make that the, the lab space more efficient, or is there ways of sharing the laboratory space with another agency or another business line within your agency? Um, what, what we would do is through our workplace consultants, we would make sure that that consultant has a deep expertise in laboratory space to do that investigation for you. Um, what we do is we don't look at just the, the special space and the office space as two separate things. We recognize that when employees are coming into the office, they may, they may very likely, they're one of the big reasons they're coming in there is because of the special space that the agency may have. But there may not be in that special space all the time. And, there, and certainly there's an office space um, component to that. So what we'll do is we look at the connection between the two. If there's any efficiencies that can be achieved either in the both in the physical or the virtual rounds, um, as far as um, doing that, um, we will investigate that as well. Um, it really comes out if you're looking at, I, I would say for all of our agencies, regard our client agencies, regardless of the types of spaces that you have, if you're just interested in looking at it in, through a different like perspective or lens, give us a call. Um, or shoot us an email and we can start talking about ideas. Um, what I'd like to do is leave you with um, uh, 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 this topic is don't think of us as space planning consultants. Think of us more as and then workplace in the broadest term, which also gets into the realm of like business consultants as well. Um, so it, again, if you're interested in looking into that, um, give us a holler. Um, also related to that, the early version of WIFM did look into special spaces and the calculations associated with that. In the new version, it's focusing just in office space because we found the special space part not working so well. However, it's an easy matter to customize the new version of WIFM for your agency. So if you happen to have courtrooms or holding cells or labs or skiffs or whatever it is, we can certainly add those in to the modeling and create a customized version of the tool that allows you to look um, uh, um, as far as the, uh, the entire picture of your space needs when you run those scenarios. That's, that's great, Ryan. And, and I, we have a couple minutes left and I do want to get to this and I, I, I'm yeah. smirking while you're talking. I don't think you're looking at the Q&A pod and I do think that you no, inadvertently no, no. and I do think you inadvertently answered this question. So I want to ask it just because it, it gets to what you just said yeah. about not a workplace planning strategist, but more of a business partner, business yeah. planning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is a customer question is talking about the shifting nature of, of space arrangements. Yeah. Um, basically indicating, you know, telework, as we've said, has traditionally been by a choice and not a mandate. Yeah. Um, but is there assistance with organizational policy changes that support the shift to more telework? So we're kind of stepping back a little bit. Yeah, and we can certainly provide some advice there. Um, but, we, but what we can also provide, and I mentioned it really early on, is information to help you decide what policy changes you want to look into. So that, that way it's not just um, a, a few individuals saying, we're gonna make it like this. What we can do is through our survey services, we have a line of questions that go along to, along the lines of preferred levels of telework, the reasons why individuals feel like they need to be in the office or not, how they're working effectively when it, uh, during COVID, pre-COVID, and, and potentially, I mean, post-COVID, um, how things change. And that data is really, really useful um, for shaping or determining which policy changes to pursue. Um, and again, that survey service is, is provided at no cost to our client agencies. One, we have a template, so it's really easy for us to, to issue out customized surveys to our clients. Two, it gives GSA information that we can look at trending 
and also look at ways of um, optimizing our portfolio, as well as look at new at services for our clients also. Um, I'll also mention, I don't know if the, the questioner or others on the line with us were in attendance yesterday. Um, we did have a, a panel with, um, it was uh, GSA's uh, Chief Human Capital Officer, it was our uh, CIO, and it was um, the Acting Chief Architect discussing just that on a big picture organizational policy change, how we've done it here at GSA, how it can be replicated in other federal agencies. So again, once we post that video, if you didn't get a chance to get, I highly recommend going back and looking at what uh, Chuck, Dave, and, and Tracy had to say. Um, Ryan, we're, we're at the, the top of the hour and the end of mm -hmm. our time, so I do want to thank you, um, and I know that we've given everybody a lot to think about, and there's a lot of resources available, so certainly the, the things that you see on the slides will make available to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you, Ryan. It's always a, a pleasure to hear from you, and we will be hearing from you next month in the Client Enrichment Series as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. All right. So at this time, we are coming to a little break between our sessions. Coming up, we do have a uh, presentation and a panel wrapped into one about all things electric vehicles. Um, and I will take a moment to note that you can still sign up to register for that session. We're going to put the Zoom link in the uh, in the chat here. So if you have someone in your organization that you think would be interested in this, again, we're dealing with things on the infrastructure side that impact real estate professionals, but we're also talking about procurement. We're also talking about utility considerations. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions about that session. So want to let everybody know that if you have a colleague that uh, can spare the next 75 minutes, we would love to have them in attendance as well. They can still sign up and join for this next session. But what we are going to do is take about a 10 to 12 minute break at this point and get our uh, virtual table set for, for the next session. Um, you can leave this window here right open, or you can just click the same link you did this morning to come back at 11.15 is when we are going to start that panel session. So thank you all very much for attending so far today, and we look forward to the rest of our session. All right, good morning once again. Welcome or welcome back to the PBS Customer Forum. Once again, I am Eric Fulton. I am your host. And if you just tuned in, you did hear that this session is being recorded. So please be advised of that. We do plan on posting recordings of all of our sessions on the GSA and other external facing websites after the conclusion of all of the events. So I want to thank everybody for joining this upcoming session. It's uh, one of the more popular topics, I would certainly say, that uh, we have been hearing about both here at uh, the GSA and with all of our customer agencies. And we are calling this EVSE Essentials, where we are going to take a deep dive into all things electric vehicles. So this is going to be a very interesting session. What we have is kind of in two parts. We're going to start by hearing from a couple of GSA subject matter experts, uh, both within PBS and other portions of our organization, uh, to talk about working with GSA on the procurement of electric vehicles and uh, infrastructure and charging stations. And then we're going to have a panel uh, with some industry professionals as well. So it's kind of in two parts. And I just want to remind everybody that you are welcome to ask questions throughout the session today. Please do so using the Q&A pod, uh, which you will find on my screen. It's at the bottom. Uh, please limit your use of the chat pod to only things technical if you're having some sort of troubleshooting issue. Any EVSE subject matter related questions, uh, please put those in the Q&A pod so that we can be aware that you have a question for one of our speakers. And I do want to introduce our first round of speakers right now. Uh, our first gentleman you're going to be hearing from today is Bill Sonnenberg. Bill is currently the program director starting up the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program Management Office 
in the public building service. And Bill has held many positions in almost 30 years here with PBS, previously working as a senior advisor and project executive on organizational transformation effort in, uh, for our Region 4, which is uh, based out of Atlanta. Uh, he's also worked as the acting deputy assistant commissioner in the Office of Project Delivery, and he served as the program director on a $1.4 billion courthouse program. He will be followed by Jesse Cohen, a program manager leading a team that is responsible for establishing a government-wide indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, that's IDIQ contracts, for general construction with design build capabilities to support electric vehicle supply equipment installation at our federal facilities across the country. I know we'll be hearing a little more about that in just a few minutes. Uh, Jesse's been with PBS for more than 15 years in a variety of of roles in acquisition management. We'll also hear from Caitlin Doremi. She started with GSA Fleet as a program analyst on the uh, alternative fuel vehicle team. And now as a member of GSA Fleet's zero emission vehicle team, Caitlin is continuing to support customers with their electric vehicle and alternative fuel needs. And following their remark, the, the remarks from that GSA team, uh, we'll turn the presentation over to Erin Lannan. Uh, she is going to moderate uh, our industry panel and introduce those folks at that time. Erin is a program manager with PBS's Center for Emerging Building Technologies. So welcome to all of our speakers. I look forward to it. And uh, with that, I will turn over the presentation to Bill. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate that. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, clean energy and fleet electrification is a priority to the administration. Uh, Executive Order 14057 requires the reduction of emissions across federal operations, investing in American clean energy industries and manufacturing, and creating clean, healthy, and resilient communities. The president has also directed the federal government to orient its procurement and operations efforts in line with the following principles and goals. Achieve climate resilient infrastructure and operations, build a climate and sustainability focused workforce, advance environmental justice and equity, prioritize the purchase of sustainable products and accelerate progress through domestic and international partnerships. The president's federal sustainability plan includes 100% zero emission light duty vehicle acquisitions by 2027 and 100% zero emission vehicle acquisitions by 2035. As such, we are assessing our electrical infrastructure within our GSA owned buildings and identifying a strategy to perform electrical upgrades when we receive funding. These priorities will have a positive impact to our environment and economy by reducing carbon emissions and greenhouse gases, reducing fuel costs and shifting consumption away from imported oil to more locally produced clean energy sources, while also creating well-paying jobs for many in the technology, manufacturing, consulting, design, and construction industries. GSA offers complete government-wide infrastructure solutions that we'll talk about in today's presentation. Next slide, please. So how does our process work? There are typically a few ways a customer request will come to GSA. Most requests will come directly to the Public Buildings Service, PBS whether to a regional office or to the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program Management Office, the EVI PMO. If the request is for a specific GSA owned facility, it is best to go directly to the building manager or facilities manager or to the lease administration manager for a GSA lease location. Delegated buildings should follow the delegation agreement typically notifying the GSA building manager or facility manager. In some cases, a fleet customer may reach out to GSA by way of the Federal Acquisition Service, FAS. 
the close collaboration and working relationship between FAS and PBS will allow those requests to get to the right place and the right people. If there are multiple locations involved, it would be best to contact the PBS EVI PMO. We would coordinate the necessary GSA resources internally and collaborate with the various affected regional offices. The type of facility will determine how we will engage to support our customer agencies. In GSA controlled facilities, so for example, in owned facilities by GSA, you should directly come to PBS. For delegated facilities, it's based on the delegation agreement, but in all cases, GSA PBS should always be involved since it is our asset. For lease locations, work with the lease administration manager, leasing CO, or leasing contract specialist who will, who will in turn work with the lessor. Next slide, please. In non-GSA controlled facilities, so our customer owned facilities, there is the option to go directly to the FAS BPA for charging stations and other services. You can also use your own contractor to install the infrastructure and charging stations or utilize the PBS and our design build IDIQ contracts. A reimbursable work authorization or an RWA is essentially that financial agreement in which our customers reimburse PBS for our services. This is required to initiate any project. Submit a work request through the external RWA entry and tracking application or what we call eRita. eRita is a web-based tool to automate and manage work requests. And this is again required of all of our customers. In all cases, submit a work request through eRita to essentially get the ball rolling. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits? Well, GSA offers complete EV solutions. The close collaboration and working relationship between PBS and FAS, as I mentioned before, creates a one GSA. Contracting vehicles, which will be presented shortly, range from minimal GSA involvement, like the self-service options, to much greater involvement through a full service option. And essentially, we offer a one-stop shop available to our customers. The FAS BPA offers charging stations and other services that we'll get into. Uh, the PBS IDIQ offers site assessment, design, construction, installation of charging stations, and commissioning of installed equipment. And we'll talk about that again shortly. One benefit of the PBS design build IDIQ is the ability for the contractors to order charging stations directly from the FAS BPA, meaning the hardware and software is FedRAMP approved and pricing is pre-negotiated. Next slide, please. So what, what are some of our challenges? Um, electric capacity in our facilities, uh, the need to upgrade that electrical equipment, and in some cases, electrical services, funding constraints, uh, the cultural change associated with going from gas powered vehicles to electric vehicles, the acceptance of EVs and eliminating the anxieties associated with driving distances and the ability to recharge your EV vehicle. Coordination and timing of obtaining and installing electrical equipment, charging stations and obtaining the electric vehicles, uh, essentially supply chain issues and the supply chain disruptions really plaguing the automotive industry. Microchip shortages, raw materials shortages, some of which uh, are controlled by non-US players in the market. Uh, labor shortages, um, shipping delays, and EV demand in many cases exceeding the supply. Next slide, please. So what actions are being taken by GSA? PBS side of GSA is contracting for site assessments 
in approximately 165 GSA owned buildings. This will help to identify electrical upgrade needs when GSA funding is received in the future. PBS is also starting to engage with electrical utility companies. This will help to identify programs available to GSA and to our customers. GSA Fleet is obtaining customer agency plans to change out vehicles to EVs over the coming years. This kind of information will help with the planning for customer demand of EV charging stations and where GSA focuses some of the funding we hope to receive in the future to upgrade electrical equipment. GSA Fleet is onboarding new electric vehicle models to mirror commercially available vehicles. GSA Fleet is also providing financing opportunities to our customers for electric vehicles. GSA FAS continues to share information about the new EVSE BPA. And this really is helping to, again, educate our customers and provide the latest update on the FedRAMP approval process. And GSA PBS is working diligently to award the complimentary design build IDIQ installation contracts. So with that, I will now turn it over to uh, Jesse Cohen uh, to speak about the PBS design build IDIQ. Thank you so much, Bill. And good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with everybody today. Uh, my name is Jesse Cohen, and I'm the PBS program manager, leading a team to establish government-wide indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, or IDIQ contracts for general construction with design build capabilities to support electric vehicle supply equipment installation. I'm excited to share some information today about these contracts, which we anticipate awarding shortly. However, I do wanna note that we are currently in the procurement process, and so I will not be sharing any procurement sensitive information. Next slide, please. I wanted to begin with some of the objectives that we had for these IDIQ contracts. The contracts are intended to support an influx of zero emission vehicles to the federal fleet and provide a streamlined procurement process to support EVSE installation and related infrastructure improvements at federal locations nationwide. We will talk more about the services included in these IDIQ contracts in an upcoming slide. However, I wanted to note an important aspect of these IDIQ contracts is that they are not limited to use at GSA locations, as Bill mentioned as well, but may also be used at other federal agency locations nationwide. In addition, the contracts are intended for use by GSA and other federal agencies as well. This means that orders under these contracts are not limited to those placed by GSA, but other federal agencies may also place orders under these contracts. We're also very excited that these IDIQ contracts provide great opportunities for small businesses, which we'll talk more about in an upcoming slide. Also, these contracts, as Bill mentioned, serve as part of a one GSA suite of complementary contract solutions for federal fleet electrification along with the GSA Federal Acquisition Services recently awarded blanket purchase agreements for EVSE, which you'll be hearing more about as well. As a complementary contract solution, the contractors under these IDIQ contracts will be able to acquire EVSE directly from the complementary Federal Acquisition Services blanket purchase agreements. Next slide, please. Moving beyond the contract objectives, I wanted to highlight some of the specific details about the contracts. Four geographic zones across the country 
are being established, and we will be showing a map of this in an upcoming slide. Each of the geographic zones are expected to have multiple IDIQ contracts. It is anticipated that the amount of each task order under these contracts may range from about $50,000 to $4 million. However, each project may have unique requirements, and so task orders may be outside of this estimated range. Each of the four geographic zones has a ceiling of $500 million across all of the IDIQ contracts within each of the geographic zones. This ceiling should provide flexibility to ensure capacity throughout the period of performance, which includes a base year and four one-year option periods. Next slide, please. Now, I would like to provide some more details about the services offered under these IDIQ contracts. These contracts will be able to provide construction with design build capabilities to support EVSE installation and related infrastructure improvements at federal locations nationwide. The IDIQ contracts will offer a full range of services that can be customized to meet the needs of each project's unique requirements. This includes feasibility studies and site assessments, as well as utility coordination and electrical infrastructure upgrades, such as conduit and switchgear work and modifications to existing electrical distribution systems. Other site work may also be needed depending on the requirements of the project. For example, this could include trenching, bollards, HVAC and fire protection work, as well as testing and commissioning. Depending on the needs of each site, a full range of design build and construction services will be available. Next slide, please. So one of the things we're also very excited about is that all of the IDIQ contracts across all four of the geographic zones are set aside for small business. We anticipate approximately six contracts in each of the four geographic zones for a total of approximately 24 IDIQ contracts. Next slide, please. This map shows the four geographic zones that we mentioned earlier. As noted, each of the zones is anticipated to have multiple IDIQ contracts and all of the contracts have been set aside for small business. Next slide, please. To provide flexibility, there are three ordering pairs to be established for use under these contracts. Ordering path one is a full service option and the traditional process of working with PBS. This ordering path may be used in both GSA space or non-GSA controlled space. In this path, PBS provides full acquisition and project management support to award and manage the project. Ordering path two is a self-service option, and this path may be used in non-GSA controlled space. In this ordering path, the ordering agency may award task orders under the IDIQ contract, and the ordering agency awards and manages the project. Ordering path three is a contract support option, and this path may be used in non-GSA controlled space. In this path, PBS provides acquisition support to award the task order, working closely with the customer agency's project management. Next slide, please. And this slide depicts a timeline of the process to establish these government-wide IDIQ contracts. As you can see from the slide, industry engagement has been a priority throughout the process. Proposals were due recently, and we anticipate beginning to make IDIQ contract awards later this summer. And that brings us to the end of my presentation. So 
I want to thank you very much. And I'm going to hand it off at this point to Caitlin for the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Jesse. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin Dormy, and I'm excited to share a quick overview of the FAST EVSC BPAs. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Our streamlined BPAs were awarded in April of this year. They are, they are a multiple award schedule BPA, so it was competed among the vendors on GSA's multiple award schedule and offers discounts below mass. GSA fleet established 16 BPAs in all, nine of which were with small businesses. There's, they are 60 month or five year agreements and currently include over 1100 EVSC products across more than 30 unique EVSC manufactured brands. And there are ordering preferences for small disadvantaged businesses. GSA fleet anticipates onboarding additional products periodically as they are added to the GSA's multiple awards schedule. All charging platforms and network stations are still undergoing GSA IT and security reviews, which was a requirement of the BPA, and they will not be available for ordering through the BPAs until this process is complete. However, all BPA products are currently available on GSA's mass contracts, which can be accessed through GSA Advantage. Until these products have completed the security process, agencies can purchase through mass, but we'll need to evaluate each product at the agency task order level to ensure it meets agency specific privacy, IT, and cyber supply chain requirements. Next slide, please. So who can access the EVSC BPA? The EVSC BPA is able to be accessed by any agency or entity that can lease or purchase vehicles from GSA. It is also open to tribes and state, local, and tribal governments in the event there is an emergency or disaster that the BPA would help them in response to, or if they are using grant funds in response to public health emergencies, or as part of a cooperative purchasing program. PBS contractors on the IDIQ contract are also able to utilize these contracts through the FAR deviation that was granted. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a visual aid to show which type of facilities can access the EVSC BPAs. This goes um, more in, or this is a shorter visual on what Bill talked about earlier. On the facility side, this will, oh, I, nope, go ahead, we can do next slide. I've already gone to that one. Um, and then before I dive into some of the offerings, just a quick reminder that um, the EV charging station infrastructure typically comes in three levels. There's level one, which is typically the fastest. It's 120 volt, but or not the fastest, the cheapest, but it's also the slowest charger. Level two, which will fit most agency needs and most building or most vehicle needs. Um, this one charges uh, a little bit faster, um, is in that medium range of price. And uh, if you're able to overnight charge or don't need to fully charge every day, this is a good point. Uh, good charging point for your needs. And then on the high end of price, but the fastest chargers are the DC fast chargers and they have the different plugs um, most used that CCS and the Nissan Leaf uses that chat mode charger. So next slide, please. So on the BPA, there are a wide range of products to include level one, level two stations, DC fast stations, networks and solar and portable options. This gives you um, an overview of which vendors fall into each of those categories. And all of the information, pricing, um, offerings, and vendor information can be found at gsa.gov backslash EVSE. Next slide, please. The FAST EVSE award also includes hourly services to include activation, site assessment, permitting, consulting, commissioning, and utility coordination, and more. Customers will need an SOW for hourly services um, and for all other acquisitions, an RFQ will be needed. We also offer charging as a service. This will include proactive monitoring and maintenance, assembly and activation of the stations, and many other benefits. This is a great option for those who are looking to have the stations, but do not have the time to manage the stations. There are ways that you can still control the parameters of the station access while the company takes care of everything else. Charging as a service does not include install at this time, but we're working to add more offerings in the future. And again, at the bottom, you'll see that gsa.gov backslash EVSC is the landing page to find out more information and resources on all things EVSC BPA. Next slide. And so I quickly wanted to touch on the different types of assistance that are available. We do have um, self-service through full service options. 
self-service for non-GSA or customer-owned facilities, um, you will determine the level of GSA involvement needed, if any. Agency, if the agency has installers or plan, plans to hire installers, they can purchase directly from the multiple award schedule and eventually through the BPA. Um, for GSA assistance, if any G agency wants assistance with the infrastructure and installation in non-GSA controlled space or is in, in a GSA controlled space, contact us. Um, for GSA owned, contact the building manager. And if it's a GSA lease location, contact the lease acquisition manager. And as always, less assistance typically means less fees and more assistance, you'll see those higher fees start to come into play. And I think that's all for me and I'll pass it back to Aaron. Okay, thanks, Caitlin. Um, hey, Aaron, this is Eric real quick. Before we jump into the next, we did have one question come in that I would just want to ask. I believe this is for Jesse. It's a clarification that came in. Um, the, someone is asking if they understand correctly that delegated agencies will be able to uh, use the IDIQ contract. Can, can you speak on that for a moment, please? Sure, thank you for that question. Um, so, Yes, the contract is for use by all federal agencies. And as Bill mentioned, if it's, um, if it's in GSA owned uh, space, then GSA would be able to provide assistance um, with using the contract. If it's in other federal agency owned space, there will be an ordering path for agencies to be able to place orders uh, directly against the contract as well. Great, thank you. And just one more before we, we head over to the panel. I think this is for Caitlin. We have someone who's asking if the BPA will be in place in time to apply FY22 funding. Yep, so right now you can purchase um, any site assessment services and non-network stations off of the BPA. And then all of the BPA products are on that multiple award schedule. So you could use FY22 funding on the multiple award schedule, and then you, you'll have the pricing available on gsa.gov backslash EVSE. So you can negotiate with the vendors to get maybe a better price. Um, but hopefully in 2023 is when we anticipate that all of the IT security reviews will be finished. All right, thank you. That that clears our queue at the moment. So Aaron, I'll turn it on over to you. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, well, we're really excited to kick off our EV panel. We have a lot of really thoughtful industry experts that have uh, gladly joined us today, and we're really excited to hear them talk. So I'm going to give a quick introduction to all of our speakers, and then we're going to kick off the panel. So first, we have Glenn Halliday, who has been with Georgia Power for over 24 years. Um, Glenn is currently the electric transportation program manager, focusing on helping Georgia Power um, business customers successfully meet the growing demand of the EV marketplace through installation of electric vehicle charging infrastructure and fleet transition. We have Eric Moberg, who's representing Pepco. He is their strategic program manager of large services. Uh, he, is an, uh, he is an MBA candidate at Virginia Tech and has a BS in Integrated Science and Technology from James Madison University. We have Tim O'Neill, who is representing PG&E. Tim has worked closely with the state agencies um, in California to help implement their EV program and match that with the PG&E EVSC program. PG&E has now shifted to fleet vehicle slash heavier duty EV vehicle segment for uh, various programs. We have Sean Tully, who is our <clears throat> supervisor in energy efficiency at Eversource. And for the past four years, he has implemented the company's EV Make Ready program with the goal of partnering with commercial and industry site hosts to provide turnkey services for their Make Ready infrastructure program. <clears throat> we have Brandon Bickneys with um, Excel. And Brandon is a product portfolio manager on the Excel Energy Clean Transportation team. He has a background in electrical distribution design and automotive retail. His role is essentially to help guide the large commercial entities in their early stage electrification path. We also have Matt Bianco, who is the president of Fedway Consulting and has provided a lot of expertise um, to various federal agencies in terms of um, working with some of the products that are on schedule. So we're really excited to have all these folks here 
And um, let's start with the panel. So what we're going to do is I'm going to ask a question and then I'll hand it off to each of the various utilities to respond for about two minutes and then um, we'll get going. So our first question is, what are the challenges facing EV infrastructure? And I think we'd like to kick this off with uh, Tim O'Neill from PG&E. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, <clears throat> so as far as some of the challenges facing infrastructure, uh, both uh, on the customer and utility side is there's an ever increasing demand for electrification of fleets, rather it's a light duty or medium heavy duty. So uh, you, uh, most of the utilities have a plan in place to how they are either trying to free up capacity or add additional capacity that's, uh, that's uh, upsizing substations or uh, reconducting uh, main feeders that go to areas that we are anticipating is gonna be a big need for additional capacity for either electric vehicle or other expansion that's going on. But the big, the big issue facing EVSC infrastructure for the customer, I think is even more important for the folks that are on this call. And I think that's, uh, you, you need to be aware that these are not quick installations. This is trenching conduit. You heard William talk about trenching and everything else going on. And so um, I think some things to really understand is get with your utility as soon as possible, as soon as you have plans, because it takes us about a year to actually accept an application from a customer and then turn around and actually have energized chargers later on. So that's probably one of the biggest things as far as the timing and the design. Uh, uh, many utility companies such as uh, pg e Pacific Gas and Electric, we have a program in place where we, it's a, it's a state funded program where we can assist customers with the, uh, the financing and the design and the build of their charging infrastructure. And so get with your utility wherever you're at and find out if that utility has some assistance program to, um, to help you with the design and installation and the financing. Uh, with with PG&E's programs, you can stack these on top of uh, normal grants and, and infrastructure. And I see that there's a whole bunch of assistance that uh, the team is gonna offer as far as helping you find grants and assistance sort of thing. But uh, get with utilities and get with them early and often and uh, let the utilities help you both design and figure out where is gonna be the best place for your charging infrastructure. Great, great answer. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I think you have a really good perspective and sure. we kind of want to swing it over to the East Coast and talk and have Glenn, if you have any other thoughts on um, that question. Sure, thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, so I think there's, there's really four areas that I, I start thinking about and, Tim touched on some of them. One would be uh, what we'll call load forecasting, right? From a utility perspective, we need to know where to invest in the grid to support EVSE, right? We wanna make sure that we're not investing where the growth, uh, well, let's just say we wanna make sure we're investing where the, um, well, investing where the growth doesn't happen is a bad thing. And then in not investing where the load grows isn't much better, right? So we've got to make sure that we understand where everything's happening and, uh, and where the load's getting, getting uh, installed and where the customers are requesting chargers. I think the second one, and it's been touched on already, is supply chain issues. You know, when we're required to invest in new transformers or build a new substation, you know, it can take three years to build a substation if it's needed. And just with supply chain issues right now, some of these, these just equipment is a year to get those things coming in. Uh, communication, right, is, is big. Plugging in a DC fast charger is not like plugging in a toaster. Even the smaller ones are like plugging in a McDonald's. They use a lot of power. It requires a lot of planning with your utility. So as Tim said, get the, uti the utility involved as soon as possible to start talking about your plans both short-term and long-term, so that the utilities can make sure you've got the power available when and where you need it. And then the last thing is timing and resources. If new investments are required, new substations, again, it's going to take time to do that. And from a labor standpoint, are the labor resources available? So, so I think those are really some of the four, I guess, the four big things on our end that I think are impacting EV or or the challenges that EV infrastructure is facing. So that's all I have, Aaron. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Glenn. And yeah, we'll pass it over to Eric at Pepco if you want to talk a little bit about what Pepco is doing in terms of 
the EV infrastructure readiness? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, you know, I think cost is, is certainly a big thing that's been touched on um, both by Tim and Glenn. You know, just the challenges with getting first the equipment and then, um, you know, interconnection with the utility. Um, so I think in terms of cost and what we're doing uh, I'm over here at Pepco Holdings is, um, you know, deploying transportation electrification programs to, to combat the cost, um, targeting both utility side as well as the customer side of the meter in terms of these programs. Um, so really just trying to tackle that and, and push, you know, our, our commercial customers well, I'll say support them um, to get them um, electrified. Um, I think another challenge that that we're seeing, and it's, I think it's continuing to evolve, much as you know, all really technologies continue to evolve, is um, you know the market itself. I would say both. You know, it seems like new vehicles are emerging on a daily basis. Um, you know, GM and BMW and all these um, vehicle manufacturers are committing you know, high volumes of different models by 2022, 2023, um, and I think to match that, there's new you know supply equipment um, that's continuing to have greater and greater um, capacity. So being able to match, you know, the vehicles with your needs as well as with the infrastructure to, to supply the, the power, um, you know, are good, huge considerations. And I think as we continue to move into the future, it's ensuring that equipment you have purchased before or purchasing now won't be obsolete, you know, in a couple, two, three, five years. Um, so I would say those are some of the challenges that we're, we're working to tackle um, and continuing to stay attuned to here at Pepco. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, and we're going to pass it over to Brandon with Excel. I think this is a really great kind of broad uh, picture here that you all are painting. So thank you. I appreciate it, and you know I definitely support the recurring message of reach out to the utility as soon as you can, as soon as you know what your plans are. Um, but I would mention I think one of the leading difficulties we hear from our customer side is that um, they struggle to, to right size what they're installing. So. Uh, we try to provide some advisory services so that we can kind of guide you through the process. And that includes, uh, to Eric's point, trying to lower upfront costs. So uh, it comes in the way of uh, make ready infrastructure programs and rebates, uh, but also in uh, fleet electrification advisory. So we help to kind of analyze data to provide information on how you can right size and how vehicles can be replaced. Um, I also think there's probably some uh, resource constraints on the customer side in, in project management, which is why, again, we tried to take as much work out of the process as possible with the programs we have in market right now. Um, and then I think, again, that upfront cost is, is probably the biggest player in, in difficulty. Um, also billing optimization. So the costs that happens after you get the charging installed, um, our goal is to help you, you know, take advantage of things like time of use rates so that you can pay as little as possible and charge during you know, the most responsible times of day so that you can save money that way as well. Great, thanks, Brandon. And then we'll kick it over to Sean um, to give his thoughts. Sure, thanks, Aaron. Um, to touch on a few things um, that haven't been talked about already, uh, just shifting some of my, uh, some of the things just to make sure we wanna impress upon people. I think Eversource, you know, as, as we're looking at the electrification of transportation and the electrification of heat, uh, especially, you know, where it, it makes energy efficiency and other non-wires alternatives more important. So, so continuing to engage, you know, not only as we're talking about, you know, some of these, some of these contracts with, you know, rolling out this EV infrastructure, but also continuing to look into other energy efficiency measures, you know, talking with utility, not only about working, working on them with them and how they can support you for the initial installation, but also, uh, you know, demand response, managed charging and some other things that can really have some non-wire alternatives that'll help defray some of the costs for those traditional wire investments. Uh, and then something a little bit more practical, I think, you know, it's a very noisy marketplace in this nascent market and EV, EV uh, charging infrastructure. And, you know, kind of just being deliberate and being smart about how you're future proofing these assets, you want to do it right the first time, uh, oversizing conduit, making sure you have room for expansion, um, you know, as you, um, you know, start out with maybe 10% of the parking having having plugs, you know, what are some ways that you can plan for the future for, you know, a level two station is about seven KW to, you know, 18 KW at the plug now, but what could that look like in, in, um, in five years or 10 years and, and making some plans around, around that? Great. Yeah, I think, I think you all bring up a lot of the high level, but also smaller steps towards getting ready for fleet electrification and EV 
um, supply equipment infrastructure. So, you know, I think a lot of folks are wondering, you know, how are the utilities working to improve the grid infrastructure and um, what are what are the various utilities doing in order to really assist? And so um, let's do reverse order. So I'll start with Sean. Oh, sure. Uh, th thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, so so for for our system planning folks, you know, we really have ramped up a lot of our, our modeling capabilities to understand EV adoption, driving patterns, associated demand in, in certain locations over time. Uh, you know, we, we are now looking at in our, in our uh, you know, 30 year plan for, for system planning, you know, 100% electrification of, of transportation. And as we are doing, uh, you know, the, the distribution system upgrades, you know, we're looking now consistently to roll those into our, our existing uh, capital plan. Great, thanks, Sean. Thanks for getting us that insight. Um, we'll go back to Brandon. And so the Edexcel Energy, do we have some pretty steep uh, carbon elimination goals uh, in the next, at least in, until 2030 and then beyond to 2050. Uh, so that kind of changes what our generation mix looks like, which means a lot more renewables on the grid, um, which I think we can help to accommodate EVs that way, um, especially through use of uh, optimization and time use rates. So again, trying to um, make sure or incentivize that charging is occurring off peak, which in turn saves you some money. Um, we've also been working on uh, piloting a transformer replacement program on the residential side uh, so that we kind of know where new EV charging is happening and we can reinforce the grid that way. Um, but on the commercial and residential sides, uh, we plan to implement hopefully some some load disaggregation so we can realize where charging is if we haven't identified it as part of one of our programs. Um, but existing efforts today uh, include, you know, Sean was talking about uh, capacity planning has been huge and in integrating capacity planning with any new EV load that comes through, uh, meaning we know where there's feeders that need to be reinforced or where new substations might be necessary or where we need to reinforce distribution equipment. Um, also, it's, I think it's been huge for us to, to have a little more insight into what's being electrified because, you know, not every electrification comes with a, a application from your service from the newer upgraded service from the utility. So our goal is to figure out, you know, where that charging is happening and build the grid uh, to suit. Great. Thanks, Brandon. Um, and we'll pass it back to Eric. Yeah, um, to add on to, to what's been said, I would say, um, you know, as we've continue to, to roll out our EV programs and um, predominantly focusing on smart level two chargers. We're gathering more and more data that's allowing us to best prepare for five, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, you know, how peaks are shifting, um, you know, how our commercial customers are, are charging. Um, so I think this gathering of insight is really allowing us to, to better prepare, um, you know, as we get, gather more and more data. Um, you know, to speak to the grid itself, I think each year we're investing millions of dollars to modernize our electric grid, um, replacing aging equipment, um, and Improving reliability and paving the path forward for additional clean energy resources like solar. Um, this work also supports electric um, vehicles um, across our service area. Um, I think a, a pretty good example of this that um, a pretty good footprint that GSA holds is the Capital Grid Project, which is a high voltage distribution loop um, serving the District of Columbia. Yeah, and I think you brought up a lot of those grid um, GAB pieces that, you know, some folks have some questions about for the Q&A, so we'll kind of get into that a little further. Um, Glenn, do you have any added thoughts on that? Yeah, you, you know, a, a lot of times we always get asked when we're working with the EV market is how is the grid going to be able to support all of these EVs that are coming and all of the chargers? And I always like to use the example, you know, Georgia Power built its first hydro plant. It was built in the early 1900s. And when it was built, it was proclaimed that it was going to be able to keep Atlanta fed with power for eternity, right? Well, today that plant uh, can is not enough and doesn't generate enough power to, um, to supply and serve some of the data centers that we have in the Atlanta area, right? So my point is of, of telling you this is, this is not the first technology to come along that uses a lot of power that utilities are having to deal with. Uh, if you do live in the South, you know air conditioning is very important, particularly today. It will be running 24 hours a day in Georgia because it's so warm today. And so, so utilities have always seen new technologies coming on board and they've always met the challenge. 
And they do that because they do things like my, my panel members mentioned around data, understanding things that are coming out. And then the other thing is going through a rigorous, uh, we go through a rigorous 30 year integrated resource plan where we look at our forecast for what the next 30 years is uh, going to bring. And so you look at 100% electrification of vehicles and things of that nature. And you wanna make sure your generation needs are being met while you continue to focus on clean energies, decarbonization and things of that nature. So we're always looking at the grid as well, making sure we're installing smart technologies so that we can improve reliability and resiliency of the grid. So I think the point is, is, is we've been doing this a while and we're gonna be there to be able to meet this need for EVSE as well. Thank you. Great, thanks Glenn. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear that historical perspective. I liked that. Um, Tim from PG&E, do you wanna expand on what PG&E is doing to improve grid infrastructure? Uh, sure. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, the uh, the fantastic thing about going last in line is uh, all the other expert panelists are doing a great job of pretty much answering the question. So, I don't have too much more to add. The only thing I will add is this, is understand that most utilities, including uh, Pacific Gas Electric, is constantly looking to add smart circuitry to our grid for reliability, either minimizing outages in one way or another, automatic switching to other circuits that are that are still energized compared to others or minimizing the length of outages so that if we have an outage, you guys know that California deal, deals with wildfire seasons and a lot of uh, uh, problems with uh, forced outages. And so uh, uh, pg and &E, and I know that there are other utilities that are also investing in smarter circuitry and smarter grid technology so that we minimize not only the quantity of uh, outages that customers experience, but also the length. And that's because the reason that's, that's big is because if you're going to try to plan on electrifying your fleet, you're going to want to know that you can drive your fleets, that you'll be able to charge your fleets whenever you need to. The other thing that we're doing in California, I'll just uh, touch on real quick, is you're going to start seeing where we're having all electric uh, truck stops or charging stations uh, for, for public. And that's huge when you're trying to electrify your fleet and maybe you don't have on-site charging or you don't want to depend on just on-site charging to know that you can have your medium and heavy duty, even class eight trucks go somewhere to, to charge up. So uh, that's a big thing in California right now. And I know that other states are looking to do the same thing. So that's a, that's a big thing, uh, both for the EVSC infrastructure and also for the grid reliability and grid infrastructure. Great, and that's that's a really good point. And I think that really segues well into this last question where before we get into Q&A, we, we want each uh, utility to discuss for the two minutes, um, what programs, rebates, incentives, and grants do you offer to your customers? So um, let's start with Eric from Pepco. Yeah, thanks again, Aaron. Uh, I'll try to touch on some of the programs across um, our three utilities that are inclusive of Pepco. Delmarva Power and Atlantic City Electric, and then talk, talk about some of our future efforts and um, some of our more recent filings. Um, to start off, so in, um, in Maryland, we have our EV Smart programs, which offer uh, incentives um, towards customers, commercial customers installing uh, level two chargers. Um, this can you know, be targeted in a variety of ways, whether it's workplace or, or fleets or what have you. Um, and, and our EV Smart programs in DC, um, accelerating deployment of public charging opportunities, um, providing make ready infrastructure for both for both level two and DC fast chargers. Um, particular to fleets um, in 2021 in Atlantic City Electric, we were approved uh, by the BPU to um, offer an EV program specific to fleets. Um, so we're excited about this new program um, and actively looking to deploy uh, more fleet specific programs across our service area. Um, and then kind of transitioning to what we're doing uh, moving forward. Um, in the district, we recently uh, fired our, filed our climate solutions plan, which is a collection of 62 programs over five years, um, targeting various um, different components of um, climate change. But uh, I think most importantly to this conversation would be transportation electrification. Majority of those programs are focused on in that area. Um, you know, it's going to allow us to, um, you know, balance our portfolio, um, promote electrification and clean energy, um, and really support, um, you know, both residential and commercial customers you know, across the district. Um, additionally, you know, we're, we're actively evaluating commercial, commercial EV rates 
um, with support from our local stakeholders. Um, we're looking to best construct rates um, while, you know, to obviously promote the transition to EV, but also, um, you know, maintain the reliability and resiliency in our system. We recently developed an EV roadmap to guide customers through the electrification process with Exelon. I'm so excited to share that. And if folks have interest in that, I'm more than happy to, to share that. Um, and I think I'll end on, I think it was touched on at the very beginning, um, just engaging your utility as, as early as you can. Uh, if you have a representative in large customer services or a similar group, uh, we, we, you know, as soon as you have an you know, idea about electrification, I uh, certainly encourage that outreach. Um, but I'm happy to pause there. Thanks, Eric. And thanks, Jessica. Hey, Eric. It sounds like you guys have a lot going on. I'm sure everyone else does too. So let's hear from uh, Brandon from Excel. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, so I think you know, focusing on the on the commercial side, we um, have some pretty great programs in market right now. Um, especially in our Minnesota, New Mexico, and Colorado territory. Um, specifically, charger rebates um, focus specifically in Colorado on income qualified and high emissions community in, uh, customers. And those will help to pay for charging equipment, um, which can be combined with our Make Ready programs to help keep the cost of very, very low to have electrification. Um, the next would be Fleet Electrification Advisory. Uh, we call it FEEP, and it's gathering of telematics data um, and any other resources you might have about your fleet to be able to tell you at no cost what the uh, right vehicle replacements might be, what impact electrification might have on your fleet, um, and in addition, suggest specific vehicles that could replace what you have in the fleet now, um, as well as talking about uh, where these vehicles spend time, so you know how long they're parked, how long they dwell, and what kind of charging might be necessary for that, so that we know Maybe a level two charger is the right fit over a DC fast charger because it parks for long enough or vice versa. Um, we also have our residential programs that can help uh, with, you know, take home fleet vehicles. Um, but I think the probably the biggest advantage in the cost savings category that we have to offer is make ready infrastructure. Um, we call it EV supply infrastructure and Excel Energy is covering everything from the point of service. Uh, so, you know, the transformer typically up to the charging equipment. So that includes, you know, conduit and uh, panels and metering and uh, everything. So it, it helps because you don't have to worry about the capacity in the existing buildings. It's are adding entirely new capacity. You don't have to worry about that upfront cost because it's being paid for. Um, and then Excel owns, installs, and maintains that for 10 years. So you also don't have to worry about uh, replacing or repairing any equipment. Great. Well, thanks, Brandon. It's really interested to hear. Um, I'm really interested to hear about that. Um, and I think we're going to keep moving just for the sake of time. Sorry, we're a little crunched here trying to get through a lot of information. Um, so we'll have Sean go next. Sure. Thanks, Aaron. I'll be brief. Yeah, it's similar to um, what a lot of other folks are, are saying. You know, Eversource has support uh, for our commercial industrial site, site hosts. Um, so we'll be able to support uh, up to 90% of the project cost up to 100% if it's in an environmental justice community. Uh, so we'll be able, that'll be everything from the new service connection all the way to the charging station. Uh, we've noticed in our first phase of our program that a lot of um, customers for level two, you know, did an average of about four ports per uh, installation that we did. So we're adding some, some rebates um, for, uh, you know, as you get over the four ports, you know, we're, we're going to start to have some, some rebates for those, uh, char those charging station hardware itself for all customers. Uh, we also have a, a alternative, uh, a, a parallel filing right now for a demand charge alternative rate. So something I just want to let everybody, our friends in the GSA region one know that falls into our electric service territory. Uh, you know, we do have a demand charge alternative rate coming for EVs. So it's very important you make sure you set these up on a separately metered service because that will be uh, the easiest way for, for you to be able to take advantage of that new rate that's coming. So thanks so much. Awesome. Great to hear about the DR charge rates, Sean. I know a lot of our regions participate in those programs. So, and it's a great revenue driver for us to reinvest into our portfolio. Um, Glenn, do you want to talk about Southern Company's uh, rebate program? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. So a couple of things that, that we, we do from a Southern Company standpoint is, is consulting services, right? Where we can help all of our customers uh, figure out what are the power requirements required to put in the EVSE. We can help with site design to make sure the chargers are going near where the power sources are. 
charge your recommendations to ensure that you're getting the right application to meet the need and the charging need is you don't always need you know, a charger per electric vehicle. And then we even offer turnkey services um, where we can provide everything from a, the, the turnkey solution for your EBSE via the GSA area-wide agreement, uh, Exhibit A in Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Uh, in Georgia specifically, we've got a, a Make Ready program as well, where Georgia Power owns and maintains all of the infrastructure up to the charger. So the customer's only cost is the charger itself. And typically this makes up um, uh, well over half the total cost of a project when you're looking at the infrastructure of the charger and the car premium. Uh, and we go through an application pro process and, and, and whatnot. You can always find more on our, our website uh, as needed. And then we also have rebates on the, the commercial side as well of $500 per charger, up to five chargers uh, per account. Uh, when the Make Ready program is not available. So, um, so we're always looking and trying to analyze what our customers need and, and put programs out there that meet the needs uh, as the market develops and changes. So thank you, Aaron. Great, thanks, Glenn. Um, and then Tim, last but not least, we'll have you round this out and then we'll go into some of the Q&A. Sure, sounds good. So a couple things that uh, very similar to uh, what you've heard uh, both from uh, Sean and Glenn and the, the other panelists, but um, I would probably add in that uh, we have um, at pg &E, we've got about four different programs right now to assist customers with charging of a structure, uh, rebates, incentives. Um, the one that is probably most prevalent right now is the EV fleet program. It's to assist customers. We give uh, most of the TTM, which is all of the infrastructure up to the meter panel. We do the majority of that uh, for free, which is normally customers have to pay for that. That's a significant savings for customers. Then we offer what we call a BTM incentive when customers install the meter panel and all the infrastructure to the base of the chargers. We, we do pay an incentive to assist them financially with paying for that. And then we do give uh, uh, some customers qualify for charger rebates, and that is about 50% the cost of the charger. Uh, one thing that I do want to end with is pg &E has put together a tool that's really valuable, and anybody can use this. If you go to fleets, with an S, fleets.pge.com, it's a very powerful tool. That tool will, uh, there's some planning uh, tips and techniques. There's ways to identify what grants you're available for outside of the pg &E program. There's total cost of ownership for your vehicle. There's a there's an electric vehicle catalog. You can decide, hey, I want a box truck that runs 200 uh, miles uh, on a charge. Uh, put in your search and it'll pop up the four that match your criteria of the different OEMs. So really great tool as far as that goes. But um, so that's just a few things within that to kind of wrap up what all the other panelists have been talking about on all the, the, the grants and rebate and incentive programs that we have available to customers to help them electrify their fleets. Great. Thanks, Tim. We, I really loved hearing that information. And I think what we'll probably have to do is uh, get a list of all of the various program pages to share out um, with folks. And then um, we had our last panelist join us. And so I'm just going to circle back and give him um, two minutes, whoops, to cover this uh, first question. This is Matt Bianco with Fedway um, Consulting LLC. And we just wanna um, have him share his experience. He, again, he's worked with various federal agencies to install EV infrastructure. So we just wanna give him a couple minutes uh, to talk and then we're gonna break out into this uh, Q&A. Thanks, Aaron. Um, just uh... <clears throat> apologize first for, for my late attendance, had something personal to attend to, but um, I'm glad I could make it. And thank you for giving me a couple minutes here. Um, so just for background purposes, I've, I've worked with federal agencies since 2014 uh, on, on charging infrastructure from concept to completion. So I did work for an OEM. I worked for ChargePoint for about four and a half years, um, left there about a year and a half ago, well, more than that now, probably <laughs> geez, two and a half years now. Um, and I've expanded my horizons a little bit. So I, I worked on, I put in over 3000 ports of EV charging uh, or assisted in that, uh, in that time, uh, you know, and it was military, civilian, uh, intelligence agencies, you name it. I come from a cybersecurity background too, prior to that. So I've got a ton of cyber experience. So the whole NIST 800 versus FedRAMP versus, you know, uh, any other type of certification you need, you know, I've, I've helped a few companies through that. 
uh, you know, and, and, and it's, it's been, you know, a critical piece to all of this. So the challenge is, and so that's my background. If anyone wants to reach out, uh, I've kind of seen it all. Um, so uh, I've also been a part of three BPAs now with this third one that came up uh, for, for product. So uh, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. So the, some of the technology I work with is still charge point, uh, as well as things like FreeWire for battery storage integration, Beam Global for solar integration, um, and having kind of transportable portable power and getting something on the ground quick, as well as many installers that I have relationships with and, and some other software companies. So really expanded my horizons to be more of an integrator to all this and just kind of a one-stop resource. Um, so the challenges, uh, and I know I've probably got about a minute left, but the, the challenges that come in, into play are, are, you know, a lot of misunderstandings of what's needed. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing, and I didn't get to hear what everyone else said, so I may be repeating things, but, uh, you know, but the, the daily replenishment is kind of the key I always go to. Uh, people always ask, what, what does it take to charge a vehicle from zero to 100%? First thing I always say is you very rarely do that. So you want to get an idea, you know, the agencies need to have an idea of, hey, let's analyze our fleet understand what, you know, how many miles a day we're actually driving that vehicle and what type of solution is needed for that. Is it mission critical? Do we need DC fast charging? Do we need to step up to something like ultra fast charging where we might be able to get 500 kilowatts into a vehicle? Um, is it just for fleet? Do we want to open these up to POVs? Um, I've become kind of a thought leader when it comes to POV charging. Uh, I spoke to Interfuel in the past and, and I've got probably a good 15 or 20 agencies that I work with um, that we handle POV charging based on the FAST Act. Um, lots of misnomers there when it comes to having to get the money back to treasury. There are other ways to get the money replenished and reimbursed from the companies um, that, that, are, that are providing the, the infrastructure and collecting the funds on, on behalf of the government. So lots of experience with POV, POV GOV, you know, there's, there's just so many challenges of understanding what is needed, taking a step back and understanding what, what infrastructure. And if I, I hit on one thing, I think that's the critical piece is people thinking they need to put in fast charging when they may not even have vehicles that have that capability. So uh, there's a lot more as Aaron knows, but, uh, but that's at least a taste of, of what I've been through. Great. Well, thanks, Matt, for sharing. Um, we're going to, we have about 10 minutes left. So we're going to pick about three questions to respond to. And um, we'll kick it off with, uh, this is a really interesting question from someone. Um, can the utility representatives elaborate on bi-directional chargers? How are you expecting it? How are you expecting GSA to work with the utilities to address demand and peak needs as well as um, sending electricity back to the grid. So um, is, is there, if somebody would like to start, I figured we could just round robin this or Brandon, I see you raised your hand. Yeah, I'd love to speak to that. Uh, right now in Colorado, uh, we have a portfolio that was approved by the commission uh, known as Partnerships Research and Innovation. And the idea there was to bring kind of new concepts to market or, or try to solve problems that we hadn't previously. And one of the initiatives in that portfolio is a, a called V2X. So that's vehicle to home, vehicle to building, vehicle to grid, um, which would be the bidirectional charging. And so our goal is to inform future program design uh, and kind of figure out how that technology works, how to fix problems associated with it. And I think that's really critical to, you know, to questions about resiliency, which I also saw in the chat. Um, and questions about, uh, you know, how we're controlling kind of that peak load. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering that. I think V to X is a really big piece of the equation and understanding how GSA can leverage their fleet to um, reduce cost of EV ownership as well as drive revenue. Um, Tim, I see you have your hand raised as well. Yeah, um, I'll just uh, add to um, add to that that uh, what uh, what we're doing in California right now is we are doing a couple pilot programs. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with the Ford F-150 Lightning. Uh, we're actually doing a pilot where we're seeing about how often that that vehicle can uh, be providing uh, peak load, uh, peak shaving as far as for the homes, but more for this uh, this group and and what's going on with fleets is uh, we're actually doing a V to, it's very similar, it's a V to G, V to X uh, program pilot where we're going to be establishing our uh, vehicle to grid um, uh, infrastructure and um, 
rates and everything else going in. So we're about a year out from that. But when we will, we will be able to uh, assist customers with allowing them to uh, uh, generate uh, revenue by delivering a lot of that power back onto the grid and getting paid for it. But uh, so in California, we're still about a year out from having our, our, uh, our programs that are fully approved by the CPUC and available to customers. Okay, great, Tim. Is there anybody else that would like to address that or should we, uh, oops, should we plan to keep moving? Okay, we'll keep moving. So um, the other question that we had was, um, is, is, it, is it going to be a concern to build out electric vehicle supply equipment in the DC area to meet the executive order goals in terms of general electrification? as there is such a concentrated area for federal utilities from an infrastructure to a capacity issue. What do you think um, and how, how do you plan to um, meet those needs? And I'll kick that over to Pepco if that's okay. Yeah, thanks Aaron and thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I think a lot of um, what I kind of touched on when it, in, the, in the grid improvement of grid infrastructure section is, is our capacity planning and, and our distribution engineering teams looking um, you know, far ahead to meet that um, you know, that to transition, which is, you know, a lot sooner than it seems. Um, so leveraging the data that we, you know, pull in through our, the fast level two chargers to best understand peak loads. Um, but, all, you know, I think the most important thing is just planning for the future. Um, the capital grid project will have that high voltage loop um, supporting the districts or allowing for quicker, um, you know, customer interconnection. Um, but, yeah, I think it's just going to continue to rely on our ability to plan, forecast, and I think is the more information that we can get um, you know, from GSA specifically and other federal customers um, as to when you anticipate electrifying the number of um, vehicles itself, the chargers, you know, the voltages and the sizes of those chargers um, will just allow us to best prepare moving forward. But you know, I think our capacity planning team does a great job in, in forward thinking in terms of 5, 10, 15 years out and beyond. Great. Uh, thanks, Eric, for giving us that oversight. And Matt, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just want to touch on the EVSC itself and how that can kind of assist in this. So um, network charging is, is pretty critical to all of this. So when you network a charger, um, most of the OEMs out there can do power management and you can start sh uh, you know, sharing, sharing from the panel, sharing circuits, uh, daisy chaining circuits out. Um, so you can put it, especially with level two, you can put in a lot more level two uh, and power a lot more level two than you normally could. So say, let's say, you wanted to put in 24 four ports of EV charging and you need a 40 amp circuit for each each port. Um, that's a lot of power. Uh, you could actually just feed it with, all, with, with that many circuits, but then you have the available power for only maybe 12 of those ports. So when 12 are plugged in, they get full power, 24 are plugged in, they throttle the power up and down based on how many cars are plugged in. So I think the network EV chargers are gonna be critical to that. Um, to allow for that power management. And it's gonna get more critical when you get into fast charging. And most companies are coming out with these modularized uh, you know, setups for the ultra fast charging um, where they're gonna do the same thing. So instead of having these static 150 or 350 kilowatt chargers, you'll feed it with 350 kilowatts, but have like six or eight dispensers and have it share that power throughout. Um, because cars are gonna be pulling at different rates and, and you know, at different times, different states of battery, um, so it's just going to be more efficient that way and you'll be able to get more charging out and networking numbers is, is critical to that. Yeah, and I think you bring up a good point where, you know, we really need to be able to track in terms of rolling up our annual sustainability reports and understanding how much electricity is attributed to uh, fuel and, you know, in this case, swapping out fuel costs for electricity costs and thinking about those things critically that networked uh, piece of that equation is really important. So we had another really interesting question um, relating to resiliency. And um, I think this is a really good point, especially with increasing extreme weather events. Uh, Rod asked, what is the charging solution for large long-term scale grid outages? For example, for emergency responses, such as hurricanes or grid failures, who is responsible for providing a solution, i.e. A, a portable generator or a backup power? So is there somebody that um, from the utilities that would like to discuss potentially those resources?
or uh, alternative. Uh, uh, or Glenn, it looks like you're gonna chat. Well, you know, I, I, I was just gonna say, I don't know that, you know, with this being more of an EV group and EV panel, I don't know that it's the, the right audience of utility folks to address, you know, storm restoration and things of that nature. So, um, you know, well, I mean, we do talk about resiliency from an EVSE standpoint, right? Because if, if there is an ice storm like that was in Texas, a couple of winters ago and they, they had customers out for several days and you've got a total electric fleet, what are you gonna be able to do to bring those vehicles back online? So there is a resiliency component that you're going to have to have some backup generation, uh, battery storage or whatever that's going to be. And I do think that, that your utilities can help you with that planning of making sure you've got resiliency in place uh, from that standpoint. So I, I think that's that's all I would, would add to that. Sure, and I think that brings up a point. Um, I know GSA is looking at right now um, modular charging stations and some of which Caitlin had mentioned in her presentation that were on the GSA mass schedule, um, free wire, uh, EV arc and um, some of the others. And so maybe Matt, you could talk a little bit about uh, kind of the, the idea behind, you know, freestanding EV chargers and how that might work in relation to this question. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And and so the the standpoint I know, you know, FreeWire and EV arcs are, are are the two that I know know the best. The EV arc, you know, although limited with with a 43 kilowatt hour battery, um, they could actually be stowed and put away during a hurricane or during a, a weather event and then brought back out to, you know, to 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 gather the energy and, and and things like that, or they're you know they're they're uh, sturdy enough to stay out in that weather and 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 be there when you need them. But I also will and FreeWire has integrated storage um, that feeds from from a lower level power source. But I think you know where you want to look is the microgrid capabilities and things that you you know you might be a little bit more portable when it comes to the EVSC as well. Um, so. Uh, you know, connecting it to that micro. I just got off a call actually uh, this morning with Fort Benning, and we were talking about uh, that those types of capabilities. Um, so it depends on the daily replenishment too. Are these mission critical vehicles? Is it CBP and their their you know pursuit vehicles? A whole different kind of way you need to view that compared to hey, if it's just replenishing 10, 15, 20 miles a day, um, maybe even 50 to 60. You know, something like the EV Arc will really handle that quite well. And those can be moved around and, and portable and such. Um, but I think the microgrid capabilities are going to be really helpful. Um, one thing that I, I worked with an OEM on is kind of a skidded feature where you could actually move that around into different areas based on, you know, on you know where you need it and that type of thing. So you could actually put that that panel and that battery storage onto the skid and move it around and that type of thing. So there's lots of ways to look at it from my standpoint. Great. Yeah, I think I think there's just a lot of possibilities out there, and it's just a matter of testing and figuring out um, what solution works best for the federal agency in their situation. And I think a lot of folks are doing the research and um, doing pilots to understand how this this could be a viable solution. Um, I do see that Pamela has one more question that I just want to clarify. Um, she's asking about the P100 for new buildings that it would include EV infrastructure. Uh, I will have to get back to you on that, but you do ask a second question on um, for existing buildings, the tenant is responsible for paying for the installation. And yes, those are those options that Bill and um, Jesse covered earlier in this session. Um, you would work with the, you would essentially, depending on if it's a lease building, a GSA owned operated building, um, you would work with your regional um, POC or your EVSE POC and uh, the building tenant would be responsible for paying for that. Uh, so we're right at 9.30. So if there are, um, I don't know, Eric, do we have a little more time to go over or are we trying to wrap this up right at- We, we, we are trying to, oh. to wrap. I'm glad you got that last question in because I know that that is something for our customers that's a, a critical element. Um, but we do have to start wrapping up. Um, I know that you, you gave away your time zone and your day is, uh, is beginning, but we're, we're at the end of our time for the, uh, 
for this session today. Um, and I want to thank a lot of people. So Aaron, I want to thank you for moderating that panel discussion and all of our industry experts. Um, if there's any remaining questions in the queue, we can we can download them and, and address them, uh, Aaron, with your team, certainly as a matter of follow up. Um, so I want to reassure people we, we knew this was going to be a popular session and that that proved to be so. Um, so thank you, Aaron. Thank you to the industry panel. Um, thank you to our GSA subject matter experts as well for all of the information. Um, there is a lot of good information about this on the GSA website. And again, as a matter of follow up, we can provide that to you and the proper email addresses and spread the information around when uh, the time is right and, and the, the BPA, the IDIQ and all that information is uh, needs to be promoted more heavily. Um, but that does bring us to the end of day two of the PBS Customer Forum. Uh, before everybody jumps off, a couple of things. First, I want to thank everyone for spending your morning with us today. We certainly appreciate it. We know it's hard to block off uh, chunks of time. Uh, it is even hard for us to put this on for chunks of time. So thank you all for, for spending a few hours with us today. Um, we will have two more sessions at our final day tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern, Project Management tools to boost transparency engagement, and then at 11.15 a.m., Building Diversity, a panel that discusses infusing cultural diversity into build, uh, into public projects. Um, I have seen both of those in Dry Run, and they are both excellent. So I encourage you to come back. If you have the Zoom link for today, you can use it for tomorrow just in case uh, you didn't sign up. And you can also share that Zoom registration link with folks uh, uh, in your organization that may benefit from hearing that. Um, I will be turning the baton over to another host tomorrow. So this is my last day at the forum this year. I just want to thank everybody one more time. Always a highlight and uh, my thanks and appreciation to the rest of the forum team working hard behind the scenes. So everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.